Hello and welcome to this Telesummit on Feminism as a Sustainability Tool. I'm Jenny LaMorgan. I'm a social entrepreneur and owner of GreenWomanStore.com, where education is a priority and we enjoy creating educational tools like this Telesummit on topics important to us as women. And I'm excited to be here with our co-host, Carolyn Gage, to bring you experts on the topic of feminism with case studies from the U.S. and around the world. Feminism and sustainability are two collective quests that touch every aspect of our lives. Feminism has always brought hope, a lot of hard work, and truth to whatever issue it touches. And we'll talk about the sustainability of feminism and the important role that feminism plays in real, lasting, and global sustainability. Our goal is to bring you hope and tools for the future and an expanded global reality, truths without denial. And we can trust Carolyn Gage to facilitate these truths with clarity and grace. She's got a little cold right now, but that clarity and grace still comes through. Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> She is a lesbian feminist playwright, performer, director, and activist. She is the author of 12 books and more than 65 plays, musicals, and one-woman shows. Carolyn specializes in non-traditional roles for women and reclaims famous women's stories that have been distorted or erased from history entirely. In 2014, Carolyn was one of six featured playwrights at the 53rd Annual World Theater Day in Rome, sponsored by UNESCO. And now I'd like to introduce our guest. She's a woman who has spent the past 45 years uncovering suppressed women's history and creating, presenting, creating and presenting hundreds of slideshows at women's and community centers, universities, bookstores, schools, libraries, prisons, galleries, festivals, and conferences in North America, Mexico, Europe, and Australia. Max Dashu founded the Suppressed Histories Archives in 1970 to research and document global women's history and heritages. She has photographed over 15,000 slides and assembled a digital archive of as many more. Max is known for her expertise on ancient female iconography, in archaeology, goddess reverence, and medicine women. Her work bridges the gap between academia and grassroots education. It foregrounds indigenous women passed over by standard histories, highlighting female spheres of power in mother right cultures, and retained even in some patriarchal societies today. Max has produced two DVDs, Woman Shaman, the Ancients, and Women's Power in Global Perspective. She's now completing The Secret History of the Witches, a multi-volume source book on women in European folk, religion, and the witch hunts, which I know she's been working on for a big part of that 45 years. I'm very much looking forward to sharing this discussion with you, so let's get started. Welcome to our co-host, Carolyn Gage. Hi, um, I just wanted to um, to point uh, up something that you just said that's tremendously important, that um, Max's work bridges the gap between academia and grassroots education. That gap is huge, and I perceive it to be growing as academia becomes more and more and more specialized and the popular culture becomes more and more um, interactive on the internet, you know, and, and historyless. And that's, it's really important to bridge that because often the activists, the people that are on the ground really agitating for social change are not in academia. And the kind of information that Max has spent her life digging up is precisely the strategies, the role models, just the, you know, invigorating history that keeps activists going, but if it stays locked up and buried in somebody's doctoral dissertation on some tiny minute point, uh, it doesn't it doesn't ever cross over, and it's one way of burying and hiding history, without without having to own that's what you're doing. But a lot of the way um, who has access to history and the way that it gets published. Um, 
in highly, you know, field-specific, non-lay um, books is just that. And I just want to say that that is, there's very few people doing that kind of work, and it's critical. It's critical for the survival of the planet. So anyway, Max, thank you for doing that work. And, um, yeah, let's start with, um, with this, uh, the demoralization of women and how your work really um, is a remedy for that. Well, and that gets back to the whole idea of the fact that we have been deprived of our history. And there are all these political ways that history gets constructed in academia. And so you've got this huge divide between people who have data and people who don't have that information. And and added on top of that, you have academia's obsession with theory, which really um, comes before the actual information. And I think what a lot of us on the grassroots ground want is we want actual knowledge about our past because it is a medicine for our spirits. It is something that authenticates our gut feeling that we have not always been subjugated beings, that women have not been oppressed across all the time of history, which has been doctrinal for a lot of time in academia. It still is in many settings. So Mm -hmm. our sense that there's something else in that vast expanse of, of history for women, you know, whether it's the mother rights societies or the medicine women, all the different what I call the female spheres of power, women desperately want to know about this. And even as the platform for investigating that in academia continues shrinking, they're not really doing women's history, less and less and less of it, even though that was really the foundation of a lot of women's studies. Uh, it's expanding in in the net realms where the activists are, where the women are, where you know ordinary people are looking for something that that stands apart from the same doctrines we've been handed since we grew up. Mm-hmm. And so that's that's really what I'm trying to do is recover cultural memory, looking through the all of the cultural record, you know, in a really interdisciplinary way to use an academic term. Our you know. And Max and I kind of share a common bond of stepping away from that academic world, and it has been a hardship, but it has been a grace. For me, the field is theater. And when I began, there was there was no way to be an out lesbian focused on lesbian work and have any hope of a career in academia. I hope that's changed. I suspect in many places it hasn't. But also, when you look at this history thing, um, you know, if you're – getting a dissertation, it has to be approved by a group of people, usually males, usually white, and that policing of what you're allowed to specialize in or publish in, it starts right there and then it kind of extends to um, where you get hired and then, of course, there's the tenure track thing, which is another way of putting you on probation for five years. I think a lot of people don't realize how much personalities and approval um, shape and color what we're allowed to research and what we aren't, and what um, we're allowed to research and to publish as well. Oh, right? exactly. These, these are all gatekeepers. You know, we have exactly. to go through multiple cultural filters, which are really based ultimately on the economics of who controls the institutions. Well, right? I've seen some of the best brains of my generation really kind of wear themselves out doing that dance of sort of trying to somehow follow their passion, but at the same time run all the hurdles and obstacles and pull an end run around the white boys gatekeeper committee. And it's such a waste of of gynergy, um, which is a word meaning women's energy. It really is. I think, oh, how, what would have been like if these women could have gone straight from point A to point B instead of having to run interference the whole time? And you're someone I see going from point A to point B directly because you you didn't stop to pick up all the little golden apples of academia. You just <laughs> ran your own race, and you were able to research what you cared about, and now we're in this glorious age of Internet access and being able to self-publish without going through the publishing gatekeepers. So, I yes, yeah, a time of great hope. But I just wanted to say for all the... You know, the low income that you have to face when you're, you know, not going down that academic route as a researcher and a writer, I really appreciate what you do. And your body of knowledge and your presentations 
is so connected up. It's so um, synapsing with um, activism, with women's experience, with our lived experience. It's just uh, every time I hear you speak, it's electrifying because you're literally flipping all the switches. It's wonderful. But anyway, I, I um, let's get into some of your specifics. Um, what would you like to talk about? Well, I just want to just comment from that last thing is that, you know, the the price of the freedom is the marginality and the way things are structured, but that freedom was always the most important thing to me is like to really stick with the subject no matter what the external uh, requirements that were laid down might be. I just decided I'm not going to play that and I'm going to just go straight after getting the goods, you know. And so there is a price you pay for that, but yet, as you say, the Internet – makes it possible to get it out there in a way that's never been possible before at this point. Yes. Yeah. But, yeah, so the subjects. Um, you know, I I really am casting a wide net, one of the things that you're not supposed to do in academia, you know, and they would call that being a generalist. And yes, that's a very me too. I'm a generalist. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm really a generalist because I'm taking on the subject of women across the world throughout history, which is really – madness in in those terms but you know i just feel like how can you even try to do theory if you don't have some basic sense of the lay of the land you know what has women's status been what is the history you know what what is the range of possibilities and what are the patterns through which women have been colonized i mean there's a whole lot of different questions if if we want to look on the positive side there's a whole lot that i found in archaeology a really strong emphasis on female iconography in early archaeology, whether you're talking about Paleolithic or Neolithic, you know, just the really older societies that we have evidence of. You know, so that's important, and that's something that's really been a no-go zone for a long time in in the scholarly world. It's like, well, you know, you're not really supposed to talk about the fact that the central icons of the Neolithic were female. What does that mean? And then we get into this whole thing about interpretation and who has the authority to interpret that material. Mm -hmm. And my position is that this belongs to all of us. Representation of women, of course, is that's my my bailiwick in terms of theater, and the policing of it is tremendous. You know, strong women on stage, but much less lesbians, have been really censored um, heavily and still are. And I think that this, uh, that what you're running into where it's nobody's supposed to notice that uh, the prevalence of female iconography in these eras, it's the same thing. If if women see ourselves in a certain way, uh, it changes the way we experience ourselves and we speak with authority. We begin to mm-hmm. tap into our um, ancestral whatever. And I like to use the word colonization. A lot of people... Uh, refuse to see a gender colonization. That's a word for indigenous peoples or something like that. But I, I feel like all women um, in patriarchy are having the, you know, that's what's been done to us, the removal of our, of we're not allowed to see ourselves, or the eraser of our native wisdom. I don't know. Do you do you find yeah. using the colonial analogy useful in your work? I use it all the time. I, I mean, from the start, I just it's very clear to me that dominant systems depend on colonizing human beings in whatever axis of, of oppression we're talking about. And I actually make a distinction between sex oppression and gender oppression because they aren't always exactly the same thing, you know. And gender really has a lot more to do with cultural categories. And then that gets us into, you know, analyzing patriarchy in a different way. But, um, you know, um, the the colonization of women's bodies, our sexuality, our reproductive power, our labor, our emotional labor, our psyches, there's all these different levels to the way that we have been colonized. And so, and these are patterns that we have to be able to look at and compare because, again, you can't really do theory about the colonization of women until you see the range of historical experiences. And that includes this vast body of indigenous history that has not been looked at until very recently in academia. So there's a whole other d- direction we have to uh, go into of looking at indigenous orature and what those testimonies have to say. 
And so, you know, this is why it's so important to look at multiple sources. But um, I think that, you know, it's, it's really a question of pattern recognition, a lot of what we're doing, what we have been doing, even starting with Matilda Jocelyn Gage back in the late 19th century, was pattern recognition for patriarchy, for alternative previous modes of culture that did have female spheres of power. She talked a lot about priestesses and even goddess veneration as models that did not fit, really models that have been declared uh, heretical in academia ever Mm -hmm. since it grew out of the cathedral schools, the Mm -hmm. all-male cathedral schools in Europe. This is where academia comes from, European Mm -hmm. Western Civ academia. You know, so we have to know something about the way the politics is about of the way that knowledge is organized in Western Civ. And mm-hmm. and that has multiple multiple angles to it. The sex oppression is important. There is also the racial caste organization of things so that if you're trying to recover indigenous histories and you go to the library you find, especially before the last 30 years, when a lot more has been published about it, that the books there are really very much part of the European colonial project and looking about, well, where's the oil and what is the history of the colonial administrations, you know, from a very Eurocentric standpoint. It's not the history of what Tanzanian people say, well, you know, we had these clans and this, you know, these, these ethnic histories that are there in orature. There's there's no place to really go in a library because of the way that libraries are organized to well, find and, and that concentrated that, that, information. That uh, transmission of oral history doesn't count or it doesn't have the same status as written word as well as written documented according to the certain rules of academia. And, and I right, think and, and, and not, not only academia but all patriarchal literate civilizations. So we could include well, as well as Europe, one China, of... and you know Arabic-speaking cultures, and you know there, there's a lot of ways in which there's a prestige hierarchy, and yes. orature is very low on that. Yes, and I think of how that's been done to women's traditional arts, like mm-hmm. quilting. Um, you know, is considered a uh, craft, yeah, and not a fine art. And um, you know, who made that call? And when you look at some of the gorgeous quilts, you know, it's just, well, it's working with fabric. That's all. It's not working with stone. That's the difference. Mm-hmm. Who works with fabric? Women. I, I'm really it's, glad you brought that up because that leads in, into one really, really key area, which is if you do not privilege writing and dynastic record keeping, which a lot of writing is, especially in ancient times, uh, correlated to, you know, the stone inscriptions and so forth, then you can start to look at weaving and ceramic painting and clay sculpture and all these areas that were female spheres of power in very early societies where women are actually originating technologies, you know, and we have to recognize them as technologies. But here's the rub, that it's not, there's not a split in these societies between the technical or the economic, you know, the, the actual life support use of the, of the objects they're creating, from the spiritual and the cultural artistic realm. It all goes together. One of and my so, favorite quotations, and I think I've already used it in these podcasts, but I'm going to paraphrase. Robin Morgan said that the genius of the patriarchy is the institutionalizing of the disconnect. And if you can do an art form that's on a stretched canvas using pigments that serves no function whatsoever other than hanging on a wall to be looked at, that has more status than a ceramic pot that you're actually using to prepare food in or a quilt, the materials of which, because of poverty, are, you know, cut little tiny geometric pieces from your family's cast-off clothing. That's, you know, it's sort of like women's art forms are intensely connected to their li- to, to, to living, to life, to the materials of life, to other purpose things, to recycling, to preparing the food, and so on. And that invalidates them. They don't have this purity of the fine arts, which only exists for consumption as art. And that has, of course, meant that we're not taken seriously, which means that these traditional art forms by women can't command the prices of the 
canvas with the black dot in the middle, you know. And that, that's one it, level. And then we've got this other level, which is that in painting that ceramics, whether it's Pueblo women artists or whether it's ancient Pakistani artists or where, whatever part of the world you're in, they are. it's a scripture of signs. It's not an alphabet. You know, it's like there's this whole bias to alphabets or even hieroglyphics, right? It's not an alphabet, but the signs they're inscribing have cosmological significance. There are stories behind all those signs. We don't know anymore what the Proverbs were or the songs or anything else that those cultures had, but we can read a little bit out of those signs. And even more so, we can begin to draw connections, and this is back to pattern recognition, between the fact that women in Costa Rica put spirals in their ancient, oh yes, their, their, their ceramic big pots. And they did that also in China. And they did that also in Romania. And so you can see that, and, and, and in the Nupe culture, you know, you can look in a global way and you can see the origination independently in all these different parts of the planet of sacred signs by women in their ceramic art, in their weaving, where often the weaving is not only a utilitarian object, not to put that down, but it was actually a ceremonial thing that is utilized in passages of birth and death and journey and initiation and all of these things. And so the weavings created by women are charged with a kind of essence from the substances they're working with, but all the dyes, the ochres or whatever they're using, and also the significance of it, the, the, um, the meanings and the sacred symbols that are encoded through their weaving or through their embroidery, which a lot of interesting feminist scholarship has explored uh, in Europe, for example. But you could also look at the huicholes in western Mexico, this way that women are working the fabric arts as a way of their their recording sacred narratives. My grandmother um, made a point. She was a southern woman, and she was born in 1898. And it was terribly important to to her that I learn embroidery as a necessary um, rite of passage as a as a young woman. But also, I did that a, too. <laughs> it's interesting. Like I I've kept up with that. I. Um, I embroider um, for people in my life that I'm particularly close to, and I do embro- I embroider them with symbol- symbols often of their choosing or quotations that are meaningful to them. And in the repetition of the stitching, and, you know, there's thousands of stitches in a, in a good piece of um, cool work, um, I, I see it as a, as a repetition of prayer, like um, what yeah. you're talking about. It is a sacred art. The making of it is ritual. And then the thing itself reflects symbols that have many, many layers. And, and I, you know, at the time, of course, I thought my grandmother was truly living in the, you know, in another era. And, you know, that this was incredibly onerous in the 1960s to be mm-hmm. learning embroidery. <laughs> and I am very grateful for it today. And I do feel, and then I go to quilt shows and things, and I will stand there and weep. I feel like I'm in that lineage that I did learn the textile arts, and I worked in fabric stores. And it is, it is, you know, it's an amazing thing. And the women coming in, they're quilting or they're sewing a christening gown for their baby or their daughter's prom dress or, you know, there's life. It's, it, 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 I just can tear up talking about textiles and so on. But um, Well, yeah. you know what you're saying about working it I think is really true. There's, there's that women's energy going into it stroke by stroke, stitch by mm-hmm. stitch, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. shuttle by shuttle. And that is, you know that it has a charge to it that is uh something that animistic cultures recognize as having power yeah i i feel that way it's almost like the the way they say homeopathy is powerful cuz you attenuate you attenuate you attenuate over and over and over again and you shake 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 uh, yeah <laughs> you and know, they potentize it by shaking the substance is going out as the intention is going in, and 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 that and so the sort of the vibration or the intention is what you're left with. I, I do feel that with um, with a, a needle a needlework piece that, and you know you have to remember why you're doing. Why am I doing this tedious whatever? And 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 then you remember how much you love the person and what your intention was in making it. Yeah, and, the love um, it. It's a refining process. It's a refining of intention. 
You know, well, anyway, I don't want to take up all your time talking about me and embroidery, but let's No, no, talk. but I have a comment about that before we change the subject, which is that <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching an online course right now on witches, and this is based on European traditions, recovery out of the European traditions. And there's quite a lot of testimony from the early Middle Ages, say, say from about 600 to about 1100, from bishops who are trying to stamp out women's spiritual customs that they were chanting in their webs or they were observing ritual silence while weaving, and omens while weaving, and evoking goddesses while weaving, and that sometimes on the looms, there's a Spanish penitential from a thousand years ago that talks about women hanging amulets of animals on the loom. And so you can see there's a whole vast cultural basket that is holding all of this. It's not separate, and it's certainly not only technological. It has all that feeling that you're talking about, and it also has a spiritual, cultural web that it exists inside. You know, so that is, that's a part of our heritage. You know, and I think each ethnicity where you have basket making or weaving, this, this is, they have this in some way. You know, just as uh, Navajo women going to collect the clay have certain songs that they sing to the clay mother. You know, that it's it's part of a whole. And we're so used, we're so accustomed and acclimated to fragmented, severed culture that we can't even recognize the degree of disconnection that we are subject to in patriarchy. You know, we don't recognize it, but we certainly feel it. It's, it translates, I think, to enormous uh, psycho-spiritual malaise, which, of course, these days gets a label slapped on it and a pill prescribed for it. But it's legion, and it is, I believe, a function of the disconnect. Um, and, well, how, what about the witches? I know that when I was coming out in the mid-'80s, I was reading a lot of Mary Daly, and she was... Um, she was really reclaiming the witches, you know, big time, and also talking about modern-day witch hunts, that, that the same, you know, animosity that informed the historical witch hunts is alive and well and um, very present in our culture. Can you share with us some of what you've... Oh, there's, there's so many different ways to go about this. First, I want to just mention, um, in, in relation to that last part, is that part of the witch hunts was acclimating women to attack other women. You know, and I, we're seeing a lot of that going on right now. I mean, women in patriarchy are, are divided class, and this has been true of actually multiple divided classes. Uh, you know, when you wrap in ethnicity and class uh, to that. But um, this, this pattern that makes women especially vulnerable to attack in the first place, and then sets women upon each other so that when women manage to get past all the gateposts and get up a little bit above the the uh, you know the the ground line, here come other women to whack them down. I mean, certainly men are doing plenty of that as well, but you know I think we are sort of uniquely uh, um, subject to that disunity from within, and so that's that's a pattern of the witch hunt that I think we are really still grappling with now. That's on the negative side. Now, on the positive side, you know, one of the reasons I, I started to actually write this book, Secret History of the Witches, in 1978, and my original wow. plan was that it would be done in time for the 500th anniversary of the Malef Malleus Maleficarum, which deadline passed in 1984, <laughs> so I'm way past that. But, um, you know, one of the things that I found really valuable because the witches have been so demonized and this has become so naturalized in the culture, it's like the legacies of the witch hunts are embedded in our culture in, on all kinds of different levels from, you know, the types of pornography that grew out of the dungeons and the whips and the gags and all of that stuff that were um, really imposed on the bodies of women through the witch hunt to the just the demonization of female power and silencing of women. This is something that's so deeply ingrained in our culture. But I'm getting off again onto the negative. What I wanted to go with that is to say that the demonized forms are so much in our minds that people think of witch as this very negative term, as a magical harm doer. And this is a slander. There was actually a blood libel against the witches as baby killers for doing contraceptive magic. 
for abortifacient magic. And this is something that the church engaged in. But one of the things that I've done is go back into the ethnic linguistics of the name to find out what in the root cultures, what did the names that they called witches mean? You know, as a way to kind of uncover how they understood these women, these wise women. And that's exactly what I found, is that the primary names for witch come to words that mean wise woman, knower, seer, diviner, herb chanter. Enchantress, of course, it means a woman who chants, right? That's, that's the meaning of that magical name for women. And we've got it in all the Romance languages. We've got it in the Norse and Saxon languages. And so, you know, different forms of these words. But chanting woman. Uh, spirit journey woman. Uh, references to shamanic flight are embedded in a lot of these witch names. Uh, herbalist. And so we could go on and on listing these, and this is actually a whole chapter in my book, is breaking this down, how names coming out of old Proto-European, sorry, Proto-Indo-European roots that mean to know and to see gave rise to a whole panoply of names for witch in these different ethnic cultures that were still around in Europe in the early Middle Ages. And so this is something very different from this idea of a witch as a destroyer or someone who does harm, which is, has become the generalized stereotype in the wake of the witch hunts. Mm-hmm. And, and so, you know, what, one of the things I want to do in this, this recovery work is to really show that everyone on the planet has an authentic spiritual root to claim. You know, we have our root cultures, and I, there's been a lot of issues in uh, feminism around white women appropriating the culture of indigenous women or other women of color. And so I think that it's really crucial for us to have our own so that we have an authentic place to stand. And, of course, that doesn't mean we're going to go back and do everything the way it was done back 1,200 years ago because we're obviously in a different historical moment and we're in a much more um, global situation where, you know, there are many cultures that women are trying to interact from and within their cultures. But I think that we need some kind of a foundation so we can say we have this, we have this thing of our own and we don't have to take that of others. You know, mm-hmm. which has been a real political issue. So, um, and I, that I think too is a medicine for women's spirits because we have never digested all of these cultural and political legacies of the witch hunts. And only by recovering the positive are we going to get balm for those wounds. That's what I believe. Well, and I, I don't feel like it was long ago and far away. You know, I was born in 1952 and, um, you know, sexual assault of women was pretty much unchecked. I mean, I remember it was, really wasn't until the 70s that you could get real convictions on that. or And uh, nobody was talking about incest. What a shock to realize that it was such a common experience. But these were ways, I think, of colonizing and controlling women. And I was also aware in the 1950s with this growing industry of, of psychology and psychiatrists that um, that my mother was threatened with incarceration. Anytime she said anything to displease my father, it was understood he could have her incarcerated as crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I just, I, I felt the terror and the fragility of being female on this planet that you really needed to attach yourself to some powerful and hopefully benign male, mm-hmm. that, that it was unthinkable you could survive without that. But if you did survive, you'd have to sort of attach yourself to some large corporate entity. Um, it just was, you know, I I grew it up really... It was intact. Really, All of that was intact. You know, it, it hasn't gone away. It's yeah, no, I felt very much like it was a witch hunt, and you step out of line, and you will be um, taken away, you know. Um, yeah, corrected, punished, whatever. Um and then you it know, was my experience as someone who tried to have an independent kind of fierce life there, that, that yeah, I was checked almost at every point. And, of course, I I had a large history of hitchhiking uh, around the country for a number of years, and that was a perpetual war zone. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I did I that mean, too. <laughs> 
people. Yeah, are. And, and and you're really aware of what you're up against. I mean, I did backpacking, and you know, yeah. it was something I would go mad if I was going to just stay confined in the city. I needed to get on the land for my own healing, and I also knew that I was risking everything because I was going to go out there, and I had been trained all my life about the dangers, but nobody really said, well, this is what you have to protect against and how to do it. It was just, just don't go out there, mm-hmm. you know. And and so, like, you know, it was a whole process of daring, boldness on the one hand, and also really, really paying really close attention with radar to the energies and to footsteps and to where I would, you know, hide myself to sleep at night and things like that in order to be out in the mountains by myself, you mm-hmm. know, and, and to forge that path. But it was going up against massive amounts of cultural conditioning, you know, from, mm-hmm. from babyhood. Really, and yeah, going and, I, and I, and I knew there was no point in discussing what I faced because it was understood. I asked for it, yeah. you know, just in wanting to have a life of vagabonding and adventure that many, many male writers had as young men. I wanted that as a young woman, yep. but I knew that there would be no sympathy um, for what happened to me because it's like, well, what did you think? What do you or, expect? Uh, didn't yeah. you know better? Or you know, yeah, or you asked for it. Um, and I think I'd kind of internalize that. I knew it's like you're on your own now, sister. If you want this bad enough, you suck it up and you just do it. But it, that, yeah, the, um, the the separating from the witch, uh, that was very much part of. You know, I felt like I had to forego female solidarity um, when I stepped out, it, wanting to live in the adventures that are really kind of the prerogatives only of men in patriarchy and that women were not hugely having my back for doing that they were mostly shaking their head and kind of looking the other way well there yeah. was a, there was a lot of us on the margin who were doing that in our our own ways you know and i really did understand that as a form of witchcraft also of being able to actually pull it off and succeed in doing that and i did uh-huh. succeed in doing it you know, and mm-hmm. that was a huge thing. You know, that I got to go up into the mountains like that, and it was it was part of my transformation and healing to mm-hmm. be able to be free in that way. I mean, it wasn't an absolute freedom because there was always this thing. Each trip was a different one. You, you had to face it again, face it again, face it again. But I used my personal power in ways when I was when I climbed into that car with my backpack. You know, that I faced each guy down in a way that let him know that it was going to be a hell of a fight if he even dared to try and, you know. I mean, I didn't say that, but I just let him know that I was powerful, you know, and I was experienced, and maybe there was something I knew that he didn't know, like, you know, did I have a weapon? He didn't know that. And, well, you know, I, want to, I want to say we all, all of us on the road during those years had our strategies, and for me, I, I have to say I was unbelievably lucky. Um, well, there's that as well. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there there's things you can do, but had I really run into the co-ed butcher of Santa Cruz, it would not have mattered what kind of strategy I had yeah. or attitude. Well, that's or the danger. Had, yeah. The danger mm-hmm. is always there. That's, yeah. that's part of it. But, yeah. you know, I think that even those guys tend to take easy people that they think, they, they tend to take women that they think they can get away with it. They don't want to have an eye put out, you know, and so there's there's a there's a there's a there's a cowardice to the bullies, you know, as well. But if they're armed, then all bets are off, you know. Yeah, I I just don't want to have any woman feel that if she had uh, worse outcomes than mine, that somehow it was, you know, lack of strategy on her part. I just am always very clear. I am extremely lucky to have survived those years. Um, just pure and simple lucky. I was as wily as I knew how to be, but I was also unbelievably lucky. Um, so I want to say that. But I think that you know this the witch hunt thing. Understanding the historical antecedents of that is really really important because. Um, you know, you just suddenly find yourself in that dynamic and you don't know where did this come from and what are what are we enacting and where did it come from? And was it always, and that's something I wanted to ask you about, was it always like this? Have you found uh, cultures where the proof is, or the evidence is overwhelming that women were empowered and safe? 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's where my interest in the mother right cultures come from, and I have to say at the outset that, um, you know, matrilineal is not the only standard that I use for that because they're, my, the model I'm using is to think about patriarchy as a historical development, layers and layers that were laid over across time into the culture to colonize women. And so in that model, you can see a decay of matrilineal societies as forces, uh, patriarchal forces begin to build up and you begin to have forms of male privilege appearing in, in those societies. So, you know, it's just like the, sometimes we're not looking at a pure mother right culture or pure matriarchy, as a lot of people would say, because you have had these historical shifts that have happened and you can look in many cases in in the oral culture of the people themselves where they will say, well, yeah, women used to do that, but men have taken that over. You know, so you can see losses that women sustained over time. And that's why oh, very often you, you have this ambiguity in, in looking at, at that cultural record. But um, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> I gave that as an intro and I lost my place. Um, oh, well, I just was thinking, I got sidetracked with the matrilineal thing because, of course, this was, some of these cultures didn't really, um, well, you know, just before DNA testing, there was really no way of um, assuring, you know, paternity. So if a child is born, it's crystal clear who the mother is, but not so crystal clear who the father is. And don't you think that some of the matrilineal um Stuff was not necessarily an honoring of women so much as a recognition of we can only say for sure she belongs to the mother's line. Well, I think that's a big that's a big thing though, because there's an African American proverb that says "Mama's baby, Papa's maybe." But one of the big machine, the big engines of patriarchy is the demand on women that they absolutely adhere to sexual fidelity, virginity codes, all of that, to a single male so that paternity can be upheld. Matrilineal societies structurally do not have that enforcement on oh, female that's interesting. sexuality. Mm-hmm. It, it, you know, it's very clear that it's a colonization because the sexual double standard is has no other purpose than to uphold male dominance and particular patrilineality. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can't have a patrilineal system. I mean, there are actually some where, like in South America, there are societies where um, there's some polyandrous societies in, in Paraguay which have what they call partable paternity, so that the woman may actually have several male partners and they all believe that they are the father of the children. It's a cultural interpretation. You know, it can, it can still be pa- um, patrilineal in a sense, but it's not... It, it doesn't put demands of sexual fidelity on the woman. So there's so all this part considered. back to the whole variation that makes it so difficult to draw hard and fast lines. But, you know, I think the important principle is that patrilineage demands enforcement of female sexuality. In I had not form. thought of that. That's interesting, yes. It's uh-huh. major. It's major for patriarchy. You know, and there's a lot of range, like I was starting to to say, you know, like there are, uh, for example, American Indian societies that are patrilineal that are not nearly as extreme in their enforcement as, you know, Chinese or Arab or European uh, patriarchies are, you know. Now, do you think that because, uh, and in my lifetime, you know, the DNA testing is still a recent phenomenon, it was not around when I was younger, do you think that that is going to in any way change the um, near fanatic um, attachment to controlling women sexually? Um, since I, I I believe it was one of the major reasons for policing women's virginity slash chastity, et cetera. Do you think that DNA testing is going to change that? Because now you can know for some degree of certainty you can determine that. I don't I don't I don't really think so I mean I think that there's you know at this point we we've come into a situation where the original causes are so displaced we've got like patriarchy so eight steps removed from the original impulses that it's become a cultural habit that there are all these attendant behaviors and and codes and and uh requirements 
uh, you know, female submission, uh, all these things are just really just generalized so that I don't know that either the pill or DNA testing or some of these other technological changes are necessarily going to affect it. What I see happening is because women are so deeply colonized, and I think North American patriarchy is, is many people can't recognize the degree of colonization because there is this illusion of freedom, right? But women are desperate to have a male sexual partner because that is still very much a cultural imperative. And then in order to get one of those, they have to behave in certain ways so that they get compliance from the men. And, you know, we have sort of this serial uh, polygamy that goes on, you know, the casting off of a woman into her middle age, and the man has the option. And this is really a dissymmetrical situation. He has much more options to go out and get a new young partner. You know, so there are other factors acting that are different than the old clan societies where establishing of patrilineage was a major concern. Does that make sense to you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and I would say in that what I'm seeing, um, you know, because I, I came of age um, in the era of the second wave, and the economy was very different then. Um, you, could, you could live on minimum wage part-time work. Not well, but you could survive and do work meaningful to you. That is not true anymore. Plus, anybody who wants college education who doesn't have family money is, is looking at six-figure debt by yep. before they're in their mid-20s. It's receding and, right out of reach. And, and the well, cost of housing I, I feel are not that, I feel like the, the, uh, it isn't just this vestigial cultural you have to have a man. I feel like we're circling back to like, yeah, you kind of have to have two incomes, you know, if you want to. You can't make it. You can't make it on your own labor, and that's that's yeah, very yeah. much. If you want to own a house, that's very much a return to... for women to the medieval situation where women simply could not earn enough to make it. You know, I mean, they were out there spinning or whatever. I mean, we have more options than that now, but I think that you know a lot of the youth are facing that really high bar in, as far as survival goes. You know, and it, it's, you know, I think that we're getting almost back to a situation like in the 20s where it's going to be less and less people able to actually get college degrees, which are still the bar. That, that's the structural bar to be able to get into all these professions. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. And I think it's um, the, the paying off of, of these this staggering degree. You know, it's a level of debt that we didn't have unless we bought a house or something. And it's, these are kids, 22 years old. They've got... Yeah. With not know, very many prospects in the job market either. I know, I know. And I recently um, rented out a room to a woman who was uh, graduating from law school. And she said they had sent people into the law school kind of coaching them. They a lot of focus on the job interviews. And that she was advised to wear her hair long because men like that better. And that you know, it was, it was. It's, re, it's replacing all those old norms. It was absolutely, you know, it, it was it was kind of um, advice that was the exact opposite of what my generation learned. Pull your hair back. Be taken seriously. Don't sexualize your appearance. Mm -hmm. And her generation is being told, play that card. Play it to the hilt. Um, if being pretty is going to help you get a job, do it, you know. And I was just appalled. I was appalled that someone had been hired to come into the law school to do this. Um, you know, it, it, it's the re-sexualization of women that in the last 20 years you have the norms being moved. And I think pornography has had a huge a lot to do with that because it's normalized. Porn norms are just like, they're they're the current norms, whether it's shoes or Brazilian waxes or all of these things performing the, the prescribed sexualized female femininity, right, is once again a requirement, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, that's what I got. She was advised not to wear flat shoes, and I remember in my generation that that was, you know, a lot of feminists felt they wanted to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with the men, that they'll be wobbling around on these sexualized whatever. And I, it just was, yeah, and it, and it was about... The rollback of feminism to me is is a function of this deteriorating economy. Um, yeah. 
a sad. Uh, well, sad. you know, it, it's the leveraging of of various forces that still it's it, because we have all these undigested uh, patriarchal norms. They've they've really it's it's like a virus that goes dormant and then it comes back when the conditions are right. And I think that a lot of the way patriarchy has functioned is that emergency situations increase the um, it, they, they push you backwards. They push women backwards. Women are forced to contend with survival situations where they cannot, they don't have a purchase. They don't have a place to put their feet and make a stand because they're just trying to stay alive. They're just trying to, you know, deal with the invading army. They're just trying to put food on their children's table. That, that is what I see when I see that student debt being just t- terribly oppressive. But I, I see now we have less than 10 minutes left. I want to just focus on what it is you offer. Um, let's talk about your webinar and let's talk about your touring presentations and how you can bring uh, Max to your community with these amazing presentations. You want to talk about Well, I have this whole, whole body of visual talks. And, you know, so they're live, very dynamic visual talks that are, I'm using images to teach. And so uh, I had like 130 slideshows, and now I'm in the process of digitizing them. So I think I have about 50 or 70. I don't even know exactly how many. But on suppresshistories.net, there's a there's a digital catalog there on the left side of the page. And you can see the variety of subjects that these are on. And so I am always looking for uh, it, it, what, what, it's difficult now to get an institutional platform because of some of the contraction that's gone on uh, in feminism and in women's studies particularly. But I'm, I do, I've always done grassroots events, and I'm continuing to do those. And I'm um, also teaching online courses and doing webcasts. And the webcast I'm especially interested in growing because that involves – you can watch it from your computer. You don't have to go anywhere nor do I have to travel to, to show mm-hmm. it to you, you know. Uh-huh. So that's going to be something that I want women to get comfortable with that format because it's got just amazing potential for us. But um, I am always looking for institutional bookings because I really feel like that is part of the the warriorship at the moment is to not lose that platform that I carved out for myself in the 80s and the 90s. You know, and it in the in the two thousand Z's it started to really, really, really shrink. And so I I think that women who are supportive of a really international women's history that is mm-hmm. intersectional and interdisciplinary and transhistoric and all those things, you know, um I would really uh, appreciate invitations to speak because I want to get my imperative is to get this out there and for women to see it and know about it. Mm-hmm. And uh you know, but also uh, grassroots venues are something that I'm doing too. Like I'm getting ready to go to the Pacific Northwest in March for Women's History Month, and I'm uh, still trying to develop for this trip uh, some some uh, bookings in Seattle and Eugene, Oregon. So, um, and Max and I have talked about this because um, you know I I tour also, and I think some people just are too shy about that, and they don't understand. Max can talk to you about how you would put this together, and also um, the fee situation is is very contingent on you know is there a large booking in the area like a university that's paying for a travel? Often um, our work is much more affordable than you might think because we're block booking in the area. So uh, you know I encourage you if you have curiosity about Max's work, don't. Uh, let those voices of, oh, I've never produced anything like this, or, oh, she probably is going to cost a fortune. Just put that aside and email her. Talk to her. Um, because these, these, um, touring is just a whole different animal. And there's a lot of flexibility depending on what other bookings are in the area. Am I right? That's- yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, there are certain requirements because, you know, it's just like I, I've gone into debt many times trying to cover the expenses of these trips. I mean, my work is to get this to women, but I need I need support to do that as well, you know. So that means that people are going to host venues and maybe maybe the local women if you, you know, if you wanted me to come to Minneapolis, I might need airfare, you know, and do a a, a local fun, you know, maybe six women could step up and and help provide that. You know, that would make it a lot easier to do the event. 
But basically, mm-hmm. I need a digital projector and a screen, you know, and uh, ideally a mic. So uh, it's not a lot in in terms of the the technical requirements. And I want to say something about some of the subjects because I I'm going to be doing this show in um, the Oregon tour. Women's Power and Global Perspective, and this is the one that I've done the most because for many years I presented it for Women's History Month at a lot of colleges and universities. And so it's kind of like the whole kitchen sink because I look at all different angles of, you know, female power and women fighting against patriarchy and fighting against colonial conquest and, you know, women's uh, what I call mother tech, you know, all of the building and farming and ceramic art and weaving and all those kinds of things, as well as female rebels and mavericks and women warriors and just a whole lot. So that is really that's, pulling together from many of your um, your shows. It's, it's right? the overview. It's the biggest overview. Uh-huh, you know, and then I have other shows that there's one called Rebel Shamans, Women Confront Empire. And this was a pattern that grew out of the Women's Power and Global Perspective presentation because I began to notice a pattern in the women who led revolts against conquest and empire that many of them were medicine women. And so I started a small show. I think I only had like 30 slides at the beginning of it. And it has grown and grown because this is talking about pattern recognition. This is a huge pattern of, you know, in Africa and the Americas in particular, but I have examples from other places here and there too that women who had a cultural sphere of power as a diviner or a priestess, whatever the the role was in that culture, Nganga in in southern Africa, were in a position to mobilize the popular resistance against an invading army. You know, Mm -hmm. and they used that as a basis. You know, they used their cultural and their spiritual authority as a basis of unifying the people and spearheading resistance. So that's a very interesting show. Love that and, idea. I think of I think of myself as a cultural worker. Um, that's how mm-hmm. I use my theater as yeah. a tool against patriarchy slash empire. Um, yeah, that's a that's a very empowering idea for women to consider what is their sphere of, sphere of power and how can they put it in service to resistance. Um, yeah, yeah, that's. That's a beautiful thing. Well, I see we're kind of at the one more minute mark. Is there anything you'd like to close with, Max, to, to wrap it up before we Yeah, turn I, I want to invite people to visit my website, which is www.suppresshistories.net, and you'll see links to the online courses and my DVDs, Woman Shaman, the Ancients, and Women's Power and Global Perspective, which I actually have a video on this as well as a visual talk. And also visit me on Facebook if you do that because I have a huge body of posts over the last five years that is, uh, if you go through the photo section, you'll see, you know, you can just pretty much follow it through and see the expanse of international um, coverage that that is happening. Yeah, being Facebook friends, it's like you get to be leaning over her shoulder as she unearths all these archaeological things. It's a, it's a, it's always fascinating because you share with us what you're currently discovering. It's very That's fun. what I love, because, you know, in the, all these years before 2000, I, all these things would come across my desk, and I would find things, and I didn't really have any place to share it with that day, you know. And now it's like, wow, look, there's this archaeological find in Korea or, you know, uh, Sudan or wherever. And, you know, it's just like it's it's just that way of tracking it. And... It gives people the knowledge that there's so much more out there than we're being shown. And that's it's so true. important to know. Yeah, so do that. Do that. Get Max on your uh, on your radar with Facebook. And the Suppressed History Archive is a gift. It's just a gift to the world. So with that, I guess I'm going to turn it back to Jenny. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Max Dashu, and thank you, Carol Engage. These are two women uncovering and rediscovering women's history for all of us. Thank you both. And again, you can find more about Max's work on her website, suppressedhistories.net. That's S-U-P-P-R-E-S-S-E-D, histories.net. And you can follow her blog and course page at sourcememory.net. That's S-O-U-R-C-E, memory.net. And do follow her on on Facebook. Um, It's Suppressed Histories page on Facebook. 
uh, the images that Max has um, gathered and that she shares with us really on a daily basis, sometimes hourly basis, they will change your com your consciousness and your life for sure. They're just amazing to see ourselves reflected historically and historically. So, and you can also sign up for Carolyn's newsletter at carolyngage.com. Carolyn tours in her own shows and is available for lectures and workshops on lesbian culture and history. And thank you again, Max Dashu and Carolyn Gage. And thank you for listening in. We hope we have informed and inspired you in many ways. And we hope that you will try to catch more of the interviews in this series on feminism and sustainability, as well as our podcast series on other issues important to us as women. And please share these interviews with your family and friends. You never know who you may be inspiring. And no matter what your description or experience of feminism is, we hope to have heightened your understanding of feminism's important role in all aspects of sustainability and restored and strengthened your resolve to build alliances for the future. For it is clear that none of us are really alone. Keep listening, and bye for now.